Well, just a month ago, several articles appeared, all citing historic changes, as they said, in K-12 educational enrollment, that's nationally. Now, according to the National Center for Education Statistics, due in part to the consequences of the COVID lockdowns in 2020, public school enrollment fell by over 1.4 million students, 1.4 million students. And that was from a total of 50.8 million in 2019, the fall of 2019, to 49.4 million in the fall of 2020. Now, and from all appearances, that number may just be low. Now, as government schools saw massive bleeding into the fall of 2020, the exodus continues with the massive increases in enrollment that we've seen in private, Christian, and home schools continuing into 2023. Now, this transition is more than significant for a lot of reasons. On one hand, it's greatly encouraging to those who know the harm being done by the wokeness and the propaganda-led curriculum in government schools, and truly exciting to those favoring a re-engagement of parents in their children's education. Now, but on the other hand, it's also alarming to those who long ago infiltrated government education, public schools, for the very purpose of undermining academic rigor in education, and even more so to undermine a Judeo-Christian worldview and seeking to prevent it from being imparted to the next generation. So between this program in part one and next week in part two, Isaac and I will look at the phenomenon driving millions of parents to move their children from government schools to homeschooling in particular. And then we'll continue this analysis of this massive exodus in later programs, focusing specifically on brick and mortar Christian schools and Christian education. And we trust that these programs both will be encouraging and educational for all who are watching this program. The title I've chosen for today's program is this, Re-Engaging Parents and the Rise of Homeschooling. Not re-engaging parents as seeking to re-engage them, although we are, but actually parents are re-engaging. So re-engaging parents driving the rise of homeschooling. My special guest today is Mr. Scott Woodruff. He is Homeschool Legal Defense Association's Director of Legal and Legislative Advocacy. He's also a member of the bar of the Supreme Court of the United States and is a frequent speaker at homeschool conferences and on radio programs all across the country. Uh, Scott Woodruff uh, calling in from Purcellville, Virginia, which is the home location for Homeschool Legal Defense Association. Thank you so much for being with Isaac and me today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on your show, Sam. Um, uh, Scott, you, the, um, this topic you used to talking about all over the country. Isaac and I are both homeschool parents, uh, and so we're, we're in this vein together, and we know it's going to be hard to condense everything. But let me get right into this. From the standpoint of Homeschool Legal Defense Association, can you establish, first of all, why it began years ago, when it began, why it began, and identify the current mission of Homeschool Legal Defense Association? Sure, Sam, I'd be happy to. When Homeschool Legal Defense was founded in 1983, there were people in jail for no crime other than homeschooling. There were people in jail. And those people needed attorneys. And it turns out that hiring an attorney, a high-quality attorney, is pretty expensive. And so the origin of the idea for Homeschool Legal Defense Association was to create an organization where many homeschooled parents could band together and make a relatively small financial contribution. And those finances would be used so that high quality legal representation would be available if they were the ones who were hauled into court next. The, the idea became uh, very widely supported across America. The organization grew and grew and grew. We defended families in court all across the nation. We also were very active in helping to shape the homeschool laws across the country. We helped improve the homeschool laws in many states. We helped uh, stop or turn back laws that would have been more restrictive. We've continued those missions. 
we have also uh, been very active uh, in the public eye to help the public understand that homeschooling is a wonderful, fantastic, viable option that produces great educational results. And we've also offered all kinds of help for families. We have consultants who will help families with special needs students, consultants who will help them with teenage education issues and many, many other areas. All right, and, uh, and Scott, that's fantastic. It sets it up very well for us today. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching today our theme, re-engaging, uh, well, the homeschool parents and the rise of homeschooling in America. We'll be back with our special guest, Scott Woodruff, in just a moment. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution, educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. And today as we're looking at homeschooling and uh, the movements that are, are going on around it, we're talking with attorney Scott Woodruff from the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. And Scott, uh, Sam started to introduce, you know, uh, how we've gotten where we're at. And, and we heard a little bit about how HSLDA uh, was founded. But in general, the, the issues that were going on in the 1970s, the 1980s, um, uh, what, what were some of the issues, what were some of the cultural pressures that homeschool parents were facing uh, that, that caused them to have to really step out to challenge not just status quo, but in many cases they were challenging the government of what they said they could or couldn't do as a family? Right, Isaac. In those early days, uh, many families were homeschooling uh, in direct violation of statutes. And to homeschool in those days, in many states, you had to be prepared for a confrontation with the law, like a sheriff knocking at your door. I've heard stories of families who had, you know, contingent plans to run out the back if the sheriff showed up, but they felt so strongly about educating their own children that they were willing to take on that risk. They didn't give up. And as they say, you know how you can tell who the pioneers are, they have the arrows in their back, but those families were courageous and they kept going and they laid a path, they laid down a very courageous example for the thousands and thousands of parents who would follow. Um, Scott, following up on that, again, I want you to go just a little bit further um, in, in regard to the cultural pressures. Now, obviously, there was a cultural fear that if they chose to homeschool, the sheriff might show up at the door, and you, you just talked about that. But there were also cultural pressures that, that actually made people and parents become interested that they needed to make a choice. I mean, the 60s, we all know, that was sex, rock and roll, and drugs. Uh, it was an age of rebellion. There are a lot of things that were going on in our country at that point. Speak to that just a little bit further, if you can, but then also tie into this. Those early pioneers in the homeschool movement, as we talked about, you just referred to, um, their motivation. I want to talk about their motivation. Was it just the fear? Was it a recoil uh, against the cultural fundamental changes that were occurring, like I just referred to? Um, is that why they just recoiling against that? Or were they driven by motivations that were perhaps deeper than just a reaction to the culture? Speak to that, because that's very important, I think, for our viewers to understand what happened back in those early days. Yeah, uh, great question, Sam. Uh, we have to give credit for kicking off the modern version of homeschooling to John Holt. He was uh, what I would call a, a far-left thinker, and he encouraged parents to get involved and educate their own kids because he thought the public schools were doing a lousy job. 
that they were just doing a terrible job actually educating kids. So he spoke and was more attractive to the folks kind of on the left end. And after that initiation, that theme was picked up on what we might call the rightward end of it. Um, James Dobson put on a show in which he publicized um, homeschooling as an option for parents who wanted to transmit their faith to their kids. Because as parents knew back then, public schools were not teaching anything about God, or if they were, it probably wasn't in the same vein of the parents' own faith. And so homeschooling for parents on that end of the spectrum was understood to be a very powerful way to transmit one's faith to one's parents, one's children, rather. Now, of course, uh, the vast group in the middle who were content with what the public schools were teaching, they were okay. And after all, one of the main missions of government education has been to homogenize society. And so the folks in the, comf- in the middle were pretty comfortable being homogenized. But the people on the left and the people on the right rebelled against that homogenization and they felt they could do a better job, they could, they could prepare kids for adulthood better if they did it themselves. Uh, you know, and, and you talk about that. My, my wife's family, they were in New York State in the 1980s, and they decided, uh, even though my father-in-law worked for the public schools, and he, he continued to work there for uh, most of his adult life, they decided it is best for our children if we teach them. And they didn't have college education degrees or anything like that. And uh, so they, they trained their own children at home, um, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I grew up in a, a home where I went to a private Christian school, but as my wife and I, when, when our kids got to the age, uh, back in 2013, I think it was, we started our, uh, our oldest son with a homeschool curriculum for K-4. And, you know, it was, it was kind of a you know, big thing to do. Well, now all of a sudden you fast forward to 2020, uh, the last three years, it used to be you say, you know, well, we homeschool our children, especially I was working in public schools at the time. And people say, oh, you home? Oh, that's kind of interesting. Well, now you say we homeschool your children and everybody says, oh, isn't that neat? I know so-and-so or my friend or we're, we're, we're starting to homeschool our children. There's been this huge shift since 2020. Maybe we could talk about what is motivating parents now and maybe contrast that with what was motivating them at the beginning of the movement and what is motivating this big movement right now. Right. So before COVID hit, homeschoolers were about 3% of the population. Then COVID hit, massive social turmoil. You know, schools became identified as these uh, uh, Petri dishes overflowing with germs and infectious agents. Schools shut, shut down. Nobody wanted to be on site. And in, in those early dark days, COVID was deadly. People were dying of it. My brother in law died of it. And so, Many of those folks who were willingly or unwillingly booted out of public school ended up homeschooling. And by the time that crisis was over, 11% of Americans were homeschooling. They weren't homeschooling because they were on the left end of the spectrum or on the right end of the spectrum. They were homeschooling just because they wanted their kids' education to continue. They didn't want it to be put in suspended animation for six months, a year, or two years. I had one person apply to join HSLDA. Uh, during that era, and uh, her kids were in virtual public school, and uh, when she applied, she made this comment. She said, uh, public schools are a dumpster fire. My kids learn more in two days than in a week of public school. Yeah, and, and Scott, that's significant, what you're saying. I want to build out on that just a little bit. You used the percentage, 11%, I think is what you just said. Um, I want you to transfer that into numbers. Is that 5 million? Like I gave a number at the beginning of the program where the National Center for Statistics said 50.8 million, I believe the number was the number of students in public schools. In the fall of 2019, it dropped down to 49.8, I believe in 2020. So if you translate that 3%, 11 percent. How many, do we know how many in millions or hundreds of thousands of kids that actually represents? I I don't know. I could uh, figure that out if I sat down and looked up um, some more details, but I'm not going to make a guess because it would probably be wrong. My dad was a math teacher in public school, but uh, he didn't pass his gift on to me. 
<laughs> well, I will tell you this, that from the National Center of Statistics, they did use a number of 5 million that they said were homeschooled in the fall of 2020. Now, that, from what I have seen, that would almost represent a doubling of those homeschooling from what it was. And again, I don't know where that is, but the bottom line is, 3% to 11% is a big increase. Now, a, a follow-up question, and then Isaac will have something else here for you, another question, but when you said that, um, that 11% or whatever, during the 2020 lockdowns, ended up homeschooling, are you talking about people who actually began to officially homeschool or are you talking about the many millions of students who were learning online at home and effectively being overseen by their parents, though they were still in the public school? Because many looked at that, I know, as an experiment and said, well, you know what? I've got to be looking over my child's shoulder. I'm home with them during the day. I'm actually schooling at home. Uh, wh which one are you referring to? Those who actually were forced to oversee their children's education on online instruction? Are you talking about people who, parents who actually began to officially, in a homeschool curriculum, homeschool their children? Uh, Sam, thanks for that question. Those numbers derive from questionnaires that the U.S. Census Bureau sends out. And they, because they had been surveying the number of homeschoolers for many years prior to COVID, they had begun to frame their questions very accurately to distinguish between actual homeschooling and people who were in some form of a public school program, whether it's brick and mortar, charter school, virtual school, online. So that 11% derives from people who self-identified and said, I am homeschooling, as opposed to being in an online virtual public school program. Scott, um, in, in regard to where we now are, uh, and we're in the next program, we're going to get into the challenges. We're going to get into um, uh, some of the issues that are deriving because so many have left public education for homeschooling. But in that regard now, just give a taste of where we'll go next week. If the original fear of parents back in the 70s and 80s was that a local sheriff could come and arrest them, because they were homeschooling their children. Um, is there any fear legally now that exists? Or perhaps what is that greatest fear that would exist right now for a homeschool parent? Or basically, have most of the battles been won legally? Right, Sam, thanks for that question. So uh, the, the fear of legal reprisals has diminished significantly. In fact, um, uh, the publication Education Week um, in its 1999 edition named Michael Ferris, our founder, as one of the 100 most important faces in education in the century. And they, they, um, they recognized him for uh, moving homeschool out of the shadows and helping to codify parents' rights. So in every state, there is a certain status of parents' legality. Now, that doesn't mean that public school officials will apply the laws correctly or leave people alone. And a great deal of what we do is corral public school officials who are breaking the law or bullying parents or inventing their own laws. So that's an important issue. Another issue to follow up on is that parents now, I think, are tending more to think about how poor quality the education their child might receive in public school. Um, here's a quote uh, from a Massachusetts uh, situation. Quote, last year the state had 80% of schools and 90% of districts characterized as failing. Quote, to have that many people identified wasn't helpful and didn't make sense, said J.C. Considine, spokesman for the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. All right. So here's a representative of the highest state education entity saying that it's not helpful for 80% of schools to be characterized as failing and 
It just doesn't make sense. My gosh, the highest education official in the state thinks it doesn't make sense, make sense that 80% of schools are failing. And that sort of attitude of, of lowering the supposed standards every time public schools come short is driving many parents to say, this is ridiculous. I can do better myself. And Scott, that's where we're going to leave this program with you right now. Next week, we're going to be back with you. I'm going to conclude with Isaac in just a moment to find out and ask him why he and his wife put their children in homeschooling years ago. But next week, we're going to pick up and continue on the legal challenges and why, why homeschool and the defense of parents' rights have benefited all parents, regardless of whether they're children in Christian education or in public education. Thanks for being with us today, and we'll see you next week. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. years, pastors have carried the light of the gospel through opposition, persecution, and every flaming arrow of the enemy. But sadly, now more than ever, our nation is experiencing a period of spiritual darkness. But what would happen if churches threw off the shackles of fear and boldly stood for truth? If 100,000 pastors around the nation joined together and committed to preaching God's Word no matter the consequence, pastors who are unaffected by changing times and the opinions of men, what would happen if America's pulpits became aflame with the preaching of righteousness? The great darkness from rejecting God's standards would be expelled, the prayers of God's people heard, our nation healed, and God's blessings restored. The time has come to stand. Isaac, let me go to you now, because you have chosen to homeschool your parents. I want to ask you a question now. I mean, your students. <laughs> homeschool your parents. Um, but why did you, why did you and Jill, when you decided to homeschool, why did you do it? And now that you have been doing it, and they are getting up in their age a little bit, are you glad you made that decision? Well, I'll start with the second one. That's easier. Yes, we're, we're glad. Uh, I'm not going to say it's easy or that every day we're really glad. There are days that are harder than others. Our oldest is now 13, and we started when he was in uh, pre-kindergarten. And, and that was kind of one of the things is uh, we said, well, we could do this stage, and let's start here and just see. And every year the Lord has given us graciously what we needed to get, to get through. Um, some of it is, you know, especially with the public schools, what, um, what Scott was talking about, I was working in the public schools at the time, and especially in the inner city public schools, one of the arguments uh, against homeschooling is, oh, you don't have all the equipment and all the teachers. And, and I saw in the inner cities that I was the one bringing in notebook paper and pencils and uh, having to go online and try to print off you know, papers because they didn't have anything. Um, so it's not always the case that they have more equipment or better, better uh, facilities. Uh, but most importantly, above all of that was our faith. And we said, we are, given the responsibility by God to rear these children in, in to, to, for His kingdom, let's start homeschooling, and every year with each child we'll make what decision we believe is best for us and for them. And it has meant laying aside things, certain work opportunities and different things like that, uh, living on less, you know, all of those things have applied, but we're so thankful that we have. And I will say this, it's not easy to be a parent mm. of a public school student, of a private, it's just not easy to be a parent of a student. And so there's no easy way out of that. And um, every, every parent has to make what's best for them and their child. But we praise the Lord that He's given us the abilities and the grace to be able to so far uh, hmm. train our children at home. And, and Isaac, I can say by looking at your children, it's very obvious that you are building into them godly values. 
And uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for being with us today as we close that. We're talking about the move, the massive exodus of people, students, from public education, not all because of COVID, but certainly driven by the close downs, but into homeschooling, a remarkable growth. And for those who have chosen to do it, I have yet to find a parent who've made the, cho the decision to homeschool their children that have said it was a mistake. Maybe there's some there, but certainly not many. Next week in this program, come back and visit for part two, because we'll get into a little bit what the Bible says about homeschooling, because really it's pretty amazing. And we'll find some of the current legal challenges uh, to what's happening there. And again, more benefits. Uh, that's all for this week.